Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first Monday in December, our last program of the year in this monthly series, uh, which is uh, a co-sponsorship, a co-sponsored programs of the University of Southern California Annenberg Center for Communication, Leadership, and Policy, and the Public Diplomacy Council. Uh, my name is Adam Powell. I'm with both USC and the PDC. We also want to thank our hosts uh, for these uh, meetings, the American Foreign Service Association. Um, and uh, as some of you know, uh, some of you who used to be in network news and network television news, at the end, I'll do really tight. At the end of the year, we always did full credits of all the people who actually made it possible, not just the people in front of the camera. So even before he walks out of the room, Alan Saunders in the back uh, from AFSA, who uh, handles all the technology. <laughs> and I see Felicia Pratt from USC, who uh, handles lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and I know in the room somewhere, although she is in the back taking a picture, um, Alma Burke, our public diplomacy fellow, who does all the logistics. <laughs> and in the very back of the room, as always, uh, Bob Heath, the executive director of the Public Diplomacy Council. Uh, we also want to welcome a person who's taking a selfie of himself right now. Uh, <laughs> Sean, <laughs> Sean Power is the new head of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. Welcome. <laughs> and uh, if I was telling Sean we'll do our best to get him up here uh, in, in front of this group soon, and he said, uh, wait a while. <laughs> um, the... Um, uh, this also being the end of the year, I saw some of you giving checks to Bob Heath, so uh, PDC members, um, uh, he's very happy to receive your uh, dues for 2017. Um, if you're wondering, those of you who aren't members, if you're wondering why you might want to become a member, we've had in the last year uh, free tickets to concerts, uh, we've had uh, members only private tours of exhibits, uh, most recently the, uh, uh, the uh, Koran exhibit at the Freer Sackler. Uh, and uh, I know several people here were part of that tour. We actually maxed out the, um, the number we were allowed here in Washington. And uh, somebody uh, in the lobby just told me that uh, um, one way of looking at this uh, membership is that for $2 a week, you get access to three free lunches a week. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's very cost effective. Um, um, we also, um, I'm trying to read my own writing here. Oh, uh, on the table in the back, those publications are all free, all for you. And if you don't uh, take them, uh, I'm going to have to take them home in a box. So, uh, uh, so we welcome your, uh, your picking up uh, books and other literature there. Uh, our guest today, his, um, uh, his bio is uh, in your programs, or I think it's on the back of the programs that you have, um, which is taken almost word for word from the website. So if you don't have a program, you can simply uh, pull up on your phone Phil's page and read the same thing. Uh, but uh, we were uh, pleasantly surprised by the, n the interest in this month's session. This is uh, one of the biggest turnouts we've had. And so when I told Phil how many RSVPs uh, we had, he said, does that make me the Mick Jagger of public diplomacy? <laughs> so uh, without further ado, the Mick Jagger of public diplomacy, Phil C. <laughs> Well, thank you, Adam, and thank you all for, for coming today. It's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here, and uh, Adam has done such a wonderful job organizing these events. Um, I see at least two of my former students who are here. Um, the, the, is it on? Can you hear it? Okay, it's got to be real close, I guess. Okay. Uh, one of my former students was already introduced, Sean Powers, who is stuffing a sandwich down right, right here, but is new executive director of the, uh, of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. And Heva Fezzi, who is an alum of our Master in Public Diplomacy program, who now apparently is devoting the rest of her life to writing her doctoral dissertation. Uh, <laughs> I, I told her I was going to do that to her. Um, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here at uh, in circumstances I didn't quite expect in terms of the, uh, the politics of this town. And uh, 
I grew up in Washington, D.C., so I'm, I'm used to the intense, uh, intense political environment, but this is, uh, this is a strange one. Um, this talk is going to focus mainly on my book, The Future of Diplomacy, wonderful Christmas gift, um, <laughs> available on Amazon, multiple copies, it would probably the best way to order it, um, but uh, I'll talk about that shortly. But first, I want to talk, since the world has changed substantially since I, since I wrote the book, I want to talk a little bit about what might lie ahead for public diplomacy. And I, I'm drawing this from a Huffington Post piece I wrote uh, right after the election. And I think among, among diplomats, professionalism has always been needed as a counterweight to ideological politics. And now that will be of extraordinary importance to the field of public diplomacy. In the field, the Foreign Service Officer will continue to serve as the backbone of American diplomacy, including public diplomacy. Many foreign publics are likely to distrust Trumpian America, assuming, and this is definitely not a safe assumption, that Trump's appointees and the Congress see value in public diplomacy programs and fund them accordingly, American diplomats throughout the world will still need to calibrate their work to match new realities. Regardless of how long the Trump era lasts, the bedrock American character will remain uncorrupted by the kind of behavior exhibited during this year's campaign. American arts and intellectual life will retain their integrity. American education will continue to be a magnet for millions of young people overseas. These are among the public diplomacy assets that in their essence will not be wholly undermined by the state of affairs in Washington. American soft power, the facet of foreign relations that relies on attraction rather than coercion, has been severely damaged and this will have a devastating effect on the role of the United States in the world. Even when their country was involved in foreign misadventures such as the Iraq War, the American people remained widely admired for their freedom, imagination, and ingenuity. The reservoir of goodwill has never run dry, but now the dam has sprung a giant leak. Perhaps the greatest challenge awaiting public diplomats will be helping foreign publics differentiate between traditional American values and Trumpian values? Can people of color feel safe while visiting the United States? Can women expect to be, respect, expect to be respected while in America? Is religious freedom in America real or a sham? Is America still worthy of emulation? Answering such questions will be difficult, especially if campaign bombast becomes presidential bombast. Until otherwise, in, until proved otherwise, a presumption of guilt in terms of bigotry of various kinds will cloud perceptions of America. Diplomats in the field will need to take the lead in dispelling those clouds. So that's the, the political commentary. Um, and uh, I'm sure we have people here of, of varying, varying political persuasions. But I think, again, that, that when you get right down to diplomacy, it doesn't matter as much as, as who is in the White House and who is at the National Security Council and who, even who is Secretary of State as it does for how the Foreign Service officers in the field do their jobs. I mean, that's the point of contact with foreign publics and that's what is, is so important. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the book and what I'm gonna do after shamelessly promoting it once again here uh, is, is give you kind of an outline of some of the points that are, that are in the book and then we can talk about uh, going to leave plenty of time for questions and discussion after this. The key premise of the book is that the future of diplomacy is inextricably linked to the future of media. More specifically, it is linked to how new media enable members of the public to become more intense observers and even participants in the diplomatic process. We have an information-rich environment which creates a sense of empowerment. And that comes from when people know more, they desire to use that knowledge. So there's a narrow distance between diplomats and publics. It used to be that the diplomats were way out here and the publics were here. 
That distance is closing in part because of the role of new media. Now, what should the public's role be in diplomacy? Well, one of my favorite books about diplomacy is a book called Diplomacy, uh, written by Harold Nicholson, the British diplomat, in 1939. And in that, he said, in the days of the old diplomacy, it would have been regarded as an act of unthinkable vulgarity to appeal to the common people upon any issue of international policy. He lamented the invention of the wireless, which gave, quote, a vast impetus to propaganda as a method of policy and allowed manipulators such as Adolf Hitler to wield, quote, a formidable weapon of pop popular excitation that could obstruct and even supersede the work of diplomats. Well, today, the common people, um, although we now refer to them mostly as the public, sounds a little bit better, from the, I like common people, but uh, are very much involved. And it would be foolish to try to, to keep them out of the process of diplomacy. And what does it mean, though, to have the public as, as a participant? Secretary of State John Kerry, as of this morning, had 2.3 million followers on Twitter. Now, that compares poorly to the likes of famous diplomats such as Katy Perry, who has 94 million, and Justin Bieber, who has 90 million, and uh, Donald Trump has 16 million. The real Donald Trump has 16 million followers. But even 2.3 million is a lot of folks. So what does that mean to the State Department? What does it mean to other countries? What does it mean to the followers themselves? And that is something that, you know, whether it's, whether it's John Kerry or Donald Trump or Katy Perry for that matter, what do people do with the information that they glean from following somebody on Twitter? Well, there are a number of factors that, that work into this. First is speed. Uh, and I'm not talking just about real-time communication here, picking up your cell phone and calling somebody or sending an email to somebody or even sending a, a tweet, putting out a tweet. Consider how tweeting and retweeting work. If you want to give yourself a real good headache, figure out, start figuring out the math. Uh, for example, if John Kerry's tweet is retweeted by 10%, of those who follow him, that's 230,000. And if those people, and this is where I'm getting way out of my limited mathematical skills, but if each of those people retweet, I mean, the numbers grow exponentially. You get into the tens of, you can get into the tens of millions very quickly. And when I say very quickly, I'm talking about seconds. Uh, it doesn't take long to retweet something. And interestingly enough, of all the world leaders the one who, he doesn't have the, the largest following, but the one who's retweeted the most, Pope Francis, um, which is kind of interesting because his messages are different than, than some of the others that are out there. Um, but the, the scope and the speed of information movement is something that, that as we'll see here, uh, is, can be problematic very quickly. And whether it's, whether it's on Twitter or on, on YouTube, for example, the case of, of Innocence of Muslims, for example, a, a few years ago, uh, a video that was purportedly part of a movie, the movie itself was actually seen once by 10 people in a theater in Hollywood, California. But the clip that was on, on YouTube was disseminated very quickly, and seen by millions of people, and people died as a result. And uh, the fact is that information flows out and counter information can, can rarely, if ever, catch up with it. So that, that speed factor is important. Another related to that is the quantity factor. There are 500 million tweets every day and 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. Uh, so you start thinking about those numbers, and again, you'll get a, get a pretty good headache. Uh, another factor is the content. Are we having a global conversation, or is this global cacophony? Um, if it's a conversation, then the, these new media can contribute to mobilization. I think if you look at the at the events in the Arab uprisings of 2011, 
they weren't the Twitter revolutions or the Facebook revolutions. They were revolutions of people who were fed up with the status quo and not having jobs and not having decent schools for their kids and that sort of thing. <laughs> but the fact is that the social media allowed a level of mobilization that was really very important. If it's a cacophony, then all this conversation can contribute to instability, which is certainly a problem. The fourth factor is that these new media can serve as an equalizer. Non-state actors can access the same tools as states use. And whether the non-state actor is Islamic State or Doctors Without Borders, uh, the fact is that they, they're, they're, these organizations and, and many others can reach the same kinds of publics in the same, with the same speed and the same scope as governments do. And governments, of course, are doing this as well. So when we look into the rest of this century, look ahead a bit, is it going to be another American century? No, I think it's going to be everybody's century. I think it's going to be that the influence and, and power are going to be much more diffuse. Now, another factor that I address, another issue that I address in the book is the danger of falling into semantic traps. Um, the term digital diplomacy, for example, or hashtag diplomacy, um, I think it's very important not to confuse substance with tools. The emphasis has to remain on diplomacy, not digital. Having new and wondrous tools does not diminish the need for policies that advance the national interest and are thoughtfully designed and articulated. If you've got bad policies, you can't save them with digital tools. And it's important to keep that in mind and not, not look at digital dissemination of information as a way to cover up mistakes that get made. If you have to have a term, I would use the term open diplomacy, reaching a large audience with high expectations about being informed directly by diplomats. And I'll give you an example of that. When the nuclear agreement with Iran was reached in July 2015, the traditional way for the participants in the negotiations to get that word out would have been to, left, to leave the negotiating room, there were a lot of press awaiting to hear from them, to go out and have a joint news conference and say it was done. That's not how they did it. They all tweeted instead before they met with the press. Uh, Federico Mogherini, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the EU, tweeted, talks done, we have the agreement. John Kerry tweeted, P5 plus one plus Iran, hashtag Iran, reached agreement bringing insight and accountability to nuclear program. Um, and as the news began to spread, the BBC did something interesting. They had a map showing the number of tweets related to the agreement that were emanating they were originating in Iran. And you could see the centerpiece, of course, was Tehran. But as the minutes passed, the tweets increased and spread throughout the country. Um, at 7 a.m., Barack Obama had a news conference at the White House. He had it at that hour because he wasn't as concerned about reaching the American public as he was about reaching publics overseas. overseas. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani used Twitter to urge his English language followers to tune into Iran's coverage. Uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu linked his Twitter feed to video of his statement, the world is a much more dangerous place today than it was yesterday. Netanyahu's Twitter feed, at Israeli PM, then featured quotes from his statement in individual tweets. Meanwhile, the White House was using Twitter at White House to frame the agreement from the Obama administration's perspective using graphics that advance the administration's position. Um, President Rouhani's tweets from at Hassan Rouhani made the case that the agreement was in Iran's best interest. In Washington, once Obama's news conference concluded, 15 principal U.S. government Twitter feeds, ranging from Vice President Joseph Biden's to that of the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv, pushed out the administration's case. Similarly, the U.S. State Department put as many social media sites to work, Facebook, Google+, Flickr, YouTube, and its Dipnote blog. 
The EU and others also provided links to the text of the agreement itself. So what is missing here from the traditional way of doing things? The gatekeepers, the gatekeepers. Why should we as diplomats, the thinking I think went, why should we as diplomats let, whether it's CBS or CNN or the BBC or the Washington Post, be the gatekeeper and decide what part of my message gets to the public when I can deliver the message I want directly to the public? Now, is that always a good thing? Well, take a look at, at how, how Donald Trump has worked. One of the reasons that he uses Twitter is, when, well, look at the press coverage of Trump during the campaign. Not one major newspaper in this country endorsed him. Not one. So to, cert to a certain extent, he did an end run using Twitter. And after the election, how did he do his first announcement to the, to the public? He didn't go to the networks and ask for airtime, which he probably would have gotten. He used YouTube. And I'm not saying this is the new way that everybody's going to do things, but the fact is that those gatekeepers, be they the New York Times or whoever, have less relevance in this era when there can be this direct connection between diplomats and political figures and the common people. Uh, you know, we go back again to, this, to the distance that used to exist. And it used to be, uh, I need a third arm here, but you'd have, the, you'd have the public, you'd have the policymakers, and in between you'd have the news media as sort of the interlocutors. They are less essential now, and one of the big challenges for the news business today is to determine and redefine their relevance because it is too easy, as Donald Trump has shown, to go around them. Now, they're still going to be influential for a while, but obviously they're in a state of some disarray. For those of you who subscribe to the Wall Street Journal on paper, you might note that over the past week your newspaper has shrunk considerably. It might have had four sections on a given day. Now it has two. And the reason they did that is because so much of the advertising is migrating to the online version. So, I mean, this just gives you a sense that we're in a state of, of turmoil, not necessarily related to the, to the political situation of the moment, but related to the economic situation of the news media. Now, I say open diplomacy, does that mean there can't be any secret diplomacy because everybody is out there ready to tweet and so on and so forth? No, you can still do secret diplomacy. And the example I would cite of that is the 2015 agreement between the United States and Cuba. Uh, those negotiations went on for months, and they, they stayed secret, which they had to because if they had leaked out the political backlash uh, would have been so significant, it's quite possible the White House would have said, eh, not worth it, let's kick the can down the road and let somebody else worry about this. But they were able to c complete those, those negotiations uh, without public visibility. So because, the, because these gatekeepers are now obsolete, the empowered public has expectations um, in, other, in other directions. And I would argue that public diplomacy is of increasing importance. Um, a few examples, China with its Confucius Institutes, uh, Russia with RT and Sputnik, uh, Israel's work to stay connected with the Jewish diaspora. The connections to the publics can be made through the new technologies, but in addition to speed and breadth, what about credibility? Uh, that's going to be a principal test for public diplomacy. It's not can we connect to the public, but will the public believe us? Uh, what, what, can we, what are we selling? What are we doing to try to convince people that our, our message is credible and important? Um, related to this, I'm sort of stretching the relationship here, but related to this is what in bureau bureaucratic terms is the place for public diplomacy? Is it whole of government, or is it important to, is it better to centralize public diplomacy, policy making, and implementation? Uh, my friend, Major Greg Tomlin, who is, who is here, wrote a terrific book about Ed Murrow's role in public diplomacy in, uh, during the Kennedy administration. And the key thing there was that President Kennedy, and this has not been replicated as far as I know by any other president, 
made Murrow and public diplomacy gave them a, a real seat at the table, in this case, the table of, the, of cabinet meetings. And that has not happened again. Now, obviously, Murrow was a, was a superstar in, in his own right, and that helped. But if you read Greg's book, Greg, you're going to have to plug my book now in the future, too. But uh, <laughs> um, if you read Greg's book, you will see that, the, uh, that, that Murrow was not shy about voicing opinions that ran against the flow of the rest of the cabinet because Murrow understood public diplomacy and understood the effect of policies in the world and provided a very, he didn't win all the time, but he provided a very valuable voice within the, the, the center of the Kennedy administration. Another thing that's going to, well, we'll have to see, I don't know if it's going to change or not, is the increased big footing by the White House over the State Department. Um, when Brent Scowcroft was National Security Advisor during the George H.W. Bush administration, the National Security Council staff numbered 40. During the Obama administration, it reached 400. And I guarantee you it was not 10 times more efficient than Brent Scowcroft's NSC. Now, Susan Rice has said that by the time she leaves, she wants it down to 300. And I think I read somewhere that General Flynn wants to, to shrink it considerably. But, you know, any of you have, who have been involved with the State Department in recent years, which I guess is, is many of you, um, you know that whether it's appointments or policy or whatever, you can get one message that the State Department has settled on, then all of a sudden the, world, uh, the word comes from the Global Engagement Office or whatever it's going to be called at the White House, and you're stomped on. And that, that, I think, needs to be straightened out. And I would hope that whoever the Secretary of State is in the Trump administration, that some boundary lines are drawn uh, between that person and the White House about who has authority for policy. So diplomacy today is, is more important in terms of leaders and publics. Um, and in the book, in my book, I cite a speech that George Kennan gave in 1961 to the American Foreign Service Association. And in it, he said, if I can find it here, um, the classic function of, of diplomacy is, quote, to affect the communication between one's own government and other governments or individuals abroad, and to do this with maximum accuracy, imagination, tact, and good sense. Kennan also had a, had a sense of the changing scope of this work, adding that, quote, the conduct of foreign policy rests today on an exercise in understanding, truly staggering in its dimension understanding not just the minds of a few monarchs or prime ministers, but understanding of the minds and emotions and necessities of entire peoples. That's public diplomacy. That's at the heart of public diplomacy. And this was 55 years ago that he, that he gave that speech. So there in that speech, I think you see from, from Kennan a bridge from the past to the future. And future practitioners of diplomacy should ponder how the field, the, how the nature of the field has been changing. Uh, going back to Harold Nicholson, uh, diplomacy is no longer and will never again be as elitist as it was back when diplomats talked only to other diplomats. It's a more public enterprise. There is new accountability and new public involvement, which means it's more democratic but will it be more effective in serving the national interest? And I will let you ponder that question and ask questions of your own. Thank you for being attentive. Thank you, Phil. And I know uh, at least two people have come with questions already. Um, <laughs> I will actually start. I see one hand in the back doing my Phil Donahue thing for those with long memories. Thank you very much for that excellent talk and for joining us and today. Everybody, please identify. I know Dan, I am Dan Srebny from the Public Diplomacy did. Council. I was wondering if you could share um, your thoughts on the best ways to effectively and strategically mix and match 
public diplomacy and diplomacy in general's engagement via digital media, traditional mass media, and I guess what I would have to call flesh and blood engagement, where you're actually in a room with a person or it's an exchange program or an <coughs> education program or a cultural event, um, because there's often a tendency to silo between them rather than yeah. having a strategy that encompasses. Well, my it, prejudice is toward flesh and blood. Um, I think there's, there's I'm, I'm very much a fan of, of exchange programs, cultural exchange programs, educational exchange programs. I know that sometimes that's a difficult sell to the funders in Congress because you go to Congress and say, we want to do this educational exchange program and bring over X thousands of students from, from wherever. And Congress says, well, what are your metrics? How do you, how do you prove this works? And of course, with some of these exchange programs, you could bring over a 19-year-old and this person has a great experience in the United States, spends a year at a US university, then goes home. And then 30 years later, she becomes prime minister of her country, still with good thoughts about the United States. That is beyond value. I mean, it's so important to be able to do that. Also, in terms of flesh and blood, I think that I, I understand the, the security situation in a lot of countries where American diplomats are based, but you can't do everything electronically. You can't have electronic outposts exclusively. I talked to somebody today who had just visited the U.S. Embassy in, in Kabul, Afghanistan, and nobody leaves the premises except by helicopter. Um, you want to go two blocks, you get a helicopter to take you. Well, Kabul might be an unusually risky place, but I've, I've talked with diplomats in other places who are relying more and more on electronic versions of contacting the public. Now, that said, I think there is still great value on using imaginative programming, and the emphasis there has to be on imaginative, to get people's attention, imaginative programming on social media such as YouTube and Facebook to engage people initially and then follow it up as it were when you can with, with, with flesh and blood. Imaginative is important because it goes back to one of, the, one of the points I made earlier, the tremendous amount of material out there. I mean, it's like when you watch television. If there's a poorly produced ad that comes on, a 30-second ad, you don't even see it. But the imaginative ones capture your attention. You remember the punchline. You remember the product. And so I think diplomacy has to, has to look at, at communicating that way as well. That's not particularly new, but the volume, given the increase in volume and speed, I think it's particularly important. Anybody else? So, I see. One hand in the back, then we'll go to the center. Oh, there's another student of mine. Hi, Martha. <laughs> uh, Charles Snyderman, Audio Video News. What do you view as the role of the more traditional mass media, print, audio, video, uh, and in particular the role of journalism in this upcoming administration? In this upcoming administration? Huh. If any. Uh, well, that that I I will not allow myself to go into the caverns of Donald Trump's mind to try to figure out where, what what he's going to do in terms of the news media, but I think and it depends on where you are in the world too. I mean, radio is still important in a lot of places. Uh, print journalism is still important in a lot of places. Uh, although the world is rapidly moving towards if not universal, close to universal connectivity, it's, it's still got a long ways to go. Um, I think about half the planet now has access it to one form or another of, of internet service. Um, good journalism, whether it's, whether it's journalism from a country such as the United States that reaches the rest of the world, or good journalism in countries where they haven't had good journalism is extremely important. And among the programs I think that, that the United States has actually done quite well with but need to be upgraded and expanded are training journalists. 
Uh, you go to some countries and there are no journalism schools. People who become journalists might try very hard, might have the best of intentions. So I think journalism is, is important in the development of democracy, the development of civil society more generally, and that should be a priority as, as part of public diplomacy. But people are still, I mean, people have not weaned themselves from traditional news media altogether. People, I don't think there are very many people who rely solely on Twitter, uh, solely on Facebook. Uh, more and more do so, and d individuals weight their attention uh, differently, but we still need good journalism. And uh, frankly, I, I'm pretty critical of the journalism that emanated from this past campaign period, and uh, I think journalism always can, can improve, but it's important too. Talk loud. Well, to take take your last last point first, I I think, I mean, there, there's been talk about just cutting cutting Fulbright to the bone, pretty much, and I think that would be a, a terrible loss. I don't know. I I mean, I hate to sound totally devoid of hope, but but Washington is increasingly a mystery to me, and and in terms of how you get things done. Um, you need champions, and you need you need popular champions who can go to Congress and go to the executive branch and say this is is what we need to do. Uh, I think there has to be, and I'm sure this has already taken place. There has to be overt lobbying on behalf of programs like like Fulbright, and I know that you and others others have have engaged in that. Um, but how you pound the value of Fulbright into the brain of a member of Congress, I don't know. You're depressing me. Uh, uh, and and as for the Naeem piece, tell me, I, I yeah, I, yeah, I read that, but. Okay, you're gonna have to refresh my memory on what it was. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jeff Rosenberg, uh, retired from NPR's modest international distribution efforts, uh, which included NPR Berlin. And as a result, I still have some ties, pretty close ties there, and I'm just back and the note that is the strongest at the moment in, in Europe's most important capital, no prejudice there, um, is uncertainty. That everything that was said in the campaign has been contradicted. There's no evidence of anything resembling policy uh, as as it's commonly understood, perhaps it'll be some new form of that. And the pe the the friends I have there say to me, you know, there's a destabilizing, uh, there's a destabilization that comes from uncertainty in Europe, where they're having some issues of their own, obviously. Um, and relating back to your notion that the foreign service officer. Uh, is the front line in public diplomacy. Do you think at the moment, whether it be in Berlin or Rome or, or Luxembourg, that there's anything that an FSO can do beside try to reassure on a one-to-one -one basis? Is there anything 
that those missions or those officers could do, or indeed the whole State Department could do, yeah. to try to calm some of the, the nervousness that comes from this uncertainty? Well, two things. I, I think uh, you might have seen the piece in the New York Times Magazine yesterday by Ian Baruma where he took a map of the world and removed the United States and removed the UK and talked about the destabilizing factors that were involved and sort of the uh, backing away from, from, from leadership functions uh, by the election of Trump and Brexit. Uh, but your question is a really important one, and I, I think although it might be programmatically difficult to do this in the job, that the Foreign Service officer has to make clear that she or he represents the United States and not Donald Trump. And that even if Trump serves for eight years, there's going to be a country after him. And the country has, has, has been around and keeps developing. And as, as I said, I think there are, there are things about American culture and American education that transcend Donald Trump. I mean, people are still, I think, are still going to want to go to Harvard. Um, regardless of who the president is they're going to want to come they're going to want to hear uh the new york philharmonic in their own, in their home home cities that sort of thing and uh that i think has to be the the point of of what the the foreign service officer that's the america that the foreign service officer has to, has to represent uh now whether that's going to be feasible i don't know i don't know what's going to happen to public diplomacy uh, until we, we see who the Secretary of State is. I have no idea what General Flynn's attitude is toward public diplomacy or Donald Trump. I wouldn't be surprised if you asked him about public diplomacy and he said, what's that? Um, but, um, but so it's, it's, gonna, it's a bit premature, I think, to, uh, to, to deal with this. I mean, there, and, and even among the people who are talked about for... Uh, for Secretary of State, Bob Corker has has been very supportive of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. Uh, I doubt that Rudy Giuliani would would feel the same way. So we'll just give it a couple weeks, and then panic. Yeah. <laughs> let's take a, let's take a question from the front. Thank you, Adam. Um, <clears throat> My name is Faith Whittlesey. I'm a former United States ambassador serving under Ronald Reagan for nearly eight years altogether. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to take issue with what you said about um, <clears throat> the role of foreign service officers. It was my understanding that in the field, foreign service officers are supposed to be representing the interests of the duly elected government. Am I wrong? the government of the United States that the people elect. Otherwise, we're not a democracy because the people have a voice, the people speak, and the policies of the duly elected government may change accordingly. And if the Foreign Service officers take the position that they are not required to advocate for the duly elected government, there is bound to be tension between the Congress and the funding aspects of the, the subjects you mentioned. Um, so I'm wondering how, how you reconcile that. Um, I, I think the comments about um, calling the people who voted for Donald Trump essentially bigots, um, is that what we want our Foreign Service officers to do? Isn't it better that they try to explain why 60 million Americans um, rejected the establishment, rejected the establishment media, and try to help them understand rather than, than disparage the very people whose interests they are supposed to be serving. Thank you. Well, I, I, think, I think that's, that's right. You, it's not the business of a Foreign Service officer to disparage the president or, or the government collectively. If a Foreign Service officer feels that, that if that's how she or he feels, the, the Foreign Service officer should resign and, and do, do, do something else. In terms of the, the duly elected government, that's an interesting point. And, and certainly if, 
if President Trump says we're going to do such and such as a foreign policy matter, again, the Foreign Service officer has has to 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 support that or get out. But there are there's a lot between individual policies. They're pretty broad interstices where the where it's more America than the current government. I mean, the, there, there are not all-encompassing policies. I mean, to go back to the, to say during the, during the Iraq war, all right, if you're a foreign service officer, you couldn't, you shouldn't criticize President Bush for waging the war in Iraq. Okay, and if you felt you should, then you, then you resign. But at the same time, you should be able to say, look, the Iraq war is not all that America is. And, and we want you to come to our country for your education. We want you to, to uh, enjoy American culture. We want you to emulate American ingenuity and take part in entrepreneur, you know, techni technological entrepreneurship workshops, that sort of thing. So yeah, it's, it's difficult and, and your point's very well, very well taken. And uh, now we've had, over the years, whether it was the Vietnam War or the Iraq War or, or other things where Foreign Service officers have resigned and because they felt they couldn't support the government. And they are agents of the government. There's no, there's no question about that. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think it's really not for me to say, it's for the individual Foreign Service officer to say, I can do this or I can't. And if I can't, I'll go be a college professor or something, you know, so take a step, take a step down. But it's, um, um, but no, you're, you're, you're on target and I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much for those uh, really excellent and very challenging remarks. Uh, I'm Greta Morris, uh, retired uh, Foreign Service Officer and, and uh, Public Diplomacy Council uh, member. Um, you talked about whole of government public diplomacy and I'm just uh, it sounds like a like a great idea to have the the, the entire government on on message but how 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 could it possibly work do you have could you say a little bit more about that please thank I, you I don't think it's a great idea actually I, I think uh, I think there needs to be to be better coordination because of in in a there are very many parts of the US government that are engaged in what is in effect public diplomacy, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Justice, and of course USAID. And those of you who are in the inside in the State Department probably know this better than I do, but I'm not sure how much actual coordination goes on. And that's that again gets back to the to the decision that has to be made at the White House and on the seventh floor of the State Department about just how important public diplomacy is going to be and and then it needs needs more structure. I mean I can think of all I mean there there are numerous changes and I get into to some of these in in the book about you know should public affairs for example be part of the under secretary's responsibility or should it be spun off? What's the what's the relationship between the under secretary for public diplomacy and USAID? Should there be public diplomacy officers named as such within the other within the other departments because when you start looking at at departments like well commerce and agriculture and justice and, and a number of the others there are people there who are doing public diplomacy when they're going to assist police departments whether they're making sure the cattle are healthy all all that sort of thing and uh, there doesn't seem to be an overriding sense of what everybody is doing. Now maybe I'm wrong and and maybe those of you at the State Department can correct me on this, but I I think if we accept and if the White House accepts the fact and the, the Secretary of State accepts the fact that public diplomacy is important, it seems to me it's always being sort of a, a, a secondary priority within the State Department. It's being nice. Public diplomacy is not about being nice. Public diplomacy is about advancing the national interest. And, and if you want to be serious about that, do it right. And I, I don't know, I have, again, I have no idea what sort of priority this is going to be given by the White House or by the, the new Secretary of State. 
But but public diplomacy, and I'll go back to to uh, to the Murrow case. Public diplomacy needs to be made more central. Uh, will USIA be reborn? I doubt it. In fact, I would bet heavily against it. I, it might not be a bad idea, but it, I just can't see Congress doing that. But but Poland, you know. I don't know what the what the structure would be, but you have to have presidential level commitment to making this work, or else it's just going to get pushed aside, and we'll buy more F 35s Let's take another one from the front, and then I'll come in the back. Hi, Phil. Jim Bullock, uh, Public oh, Diplomacy sure. Council, and yeah. other things. Um, I went to a talk last week. Many of us were there. And the factoid was dropped out that in the last week of the campaign, uh, 17 of the 20 most popular messages, I think they were Facebook, I can't quite remember, that were circulating in the, the uh, you know, the cybersphere were false news. And that they didn't matter. We're in a post-truth world where uh, people respond to the messages that correspond to what they already believe. Now, if that's the case, doesn't that take us back to this whole notion of who you are speaks so loud, I can't hear what you're saying? And we had a follow-up discussion at that same event last week where it's like they said that foreign service officers are in the field because they're supposed to advocate. You're not out there to make friends. And I might counter suggest that that's all we, when we're out there, our job is to actually build those relationships. It gets at what you were saying, talking about education, talking about American culture. You're not disagreeing with American policy, but you're putting a focus on establishing relationship, establishing a channel, establishing credibility through which when the opportunity comes up, when the question comes up for advocacy, you have a credible, receptive audience. Because otherwise, it's like a Sunday morning talk show where people are yelling their talking points at each other and nobody's listening. Well, I think your point about about fake news is extremely important. And you know, where I live in, in Pasadena, California, the, the kindergartens there, every student has a tablet in the kindergarten. And so we've got a, a coming generation that will have grown up knowing, you know, that that's that's where you get your information. And certainly my students who average I teach mostly grad students who average in age twenty seven or so they have made the transition in their lifetimes from, from traditional media to, to new media. And how we deal with fake news, I think it's, it's really not so much a diplomacy issue as it is a matter of media literacy. And you know that's a term that's almost become a cliche now. But you know, we teach a course at USC in media literacy, but it, it's for just the communication students. I think it should be for every student in the university because you have to understand how do you how do you deal with fake news? Well, you look for corroboration, you look to other sources. You've got to have a certain intellectual discipline to do that. And that discipline doesn't doesn't occur necessarily by itself. I mean, maybe your parents can teach it to you, but but it probably should be and it probably shouldn't wait till you get to USC. It should probably be about first grade or fourth grade or something like that, where you start getting that training. Because if media have become such an important part of so many aspects of our lives, not just getting news, but buying stuff and things like that, um, then we need to understand the media better. And that, I think, might might help with fake news. I mean, this, this guy with the gun at the pizza place yesterday out on Connecticut Avenue, well, he was responding to fake news. And then after the event apparently there was more fake news wait a minute this guy was right you know i mean what do we i don't know i don't know but i think i think you have to have an audience that is smart enough to be able or trained intellectually trained well enough to look for other sources and not to accept you know it's on the internet it must be true uh that that won't fly but that's going to be a generational thing I'm going to be living on the west coast of Scotland. I, you know, I've got to, <laughs> you all worry about this, but it's um, um, I think is a huge, huge issue, and the and the fake news thing is is extremely, extremely bothersome, particularly the the amount of consumption that went on of that news. Oops, there's somebody back here. Hi. Hi, hi. My name is Rashida Peterson. I own a company. Um, get, the, get the mic closer to you. Yeah, called 1847 Philanthropic, um, which works on international development. 
Um, I, I just kind of wanted to follow up on what you were saying. I was going to mention the whole there's no such thing as facts anymore um, piece of it that you mentioned. But I also think that um, the ambassador uh, mentioned something that is really important. And you were saying, you know, the commoners, and I know you were saying that tongue in cheek, but I think that this election has really made it very clear to us that people feel disenfranchised and they feel like they're not connected to their government. And so um, I think that that's a diversity issue. I think that that's a, you know, us in Washington versus, you know, or the coast versus others issue. So I would like for you uh, maybe to talk a little bit about what the Foreign Service can do to kind of address some of those issues. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I, th I think what you said is absolutely true about alienation within the United States based on on a whole variety of things and, and what people perceive as a failure of government to, um, to do what government is supposed to do, which is to help make the lives of its citizens better. The extent to which country A can intervene into that process in country B, I wonder about that. Um, I wonder how much the, the Foreign Service, the U.S. Foreign Service can do and could do properly within Egypt, let's say, uh, to, you know, there you've got a very fraught situation and everything involving human rights and the economy and everything else. To what degree, without seeming callous about it, to what degree <laughs> is it our business, unless it becomes the policy of the United States to you know, we still give them billions of dollars a year. Um, you know, there, there would have to be, I think, a policy change before you can do anything about that. I think that the, in the issue in the United States is certainly not the business of foreign service officers. So am I missing your point, or? Well, it does matter, and certainly you get representatives of the, of the State Department and other departments for that matter. I'm not sure they're, they're foreign service officers all the time who, who travel within the United States and speak to groups and say, this is why what we do is so, so valuable. You know, the, the standard comment on this is if you ask people on the street what percentage of the U.S. budget goes to foreign aid, well, let's say 15 to 20 percent, when of course it's less than one percent. And, and so the public, the U.S. public, does need educating. Um, the extent to which you want to get foreign service officers involved and accept it, well, I don't, I don't even know what the rules are on that, but, but to get foreign service officers involved and what are basically domestic political issues, I think, is limited. I think the State Department, though, needs to do that. That's public affairs people at the State Department need to do that. Um, people at the, at the undersecretary and assistant secretary level need to do that, and they do it. They do it. I mean, they, you, they pop up all the time in Los Angeles, and, it's, and I'm sure they do. You know, Los Angeles, nobody cares about because it's a, a left-wing secessionist state, but it's... Uh, um, but but they they show up in Indianapolis and Omaha and places like that too. They're out there they're out there doing, uh, justifying what they do. And for exactly the reason you say, it's the budget. I mean, if you don't have some pressure put put on members of Congress that this is worthwhile, so you better vote for it, then you're then you're in trouble. But 
mean, every every branch of the government does that. You know, one of the the striking examples uh, are these these groups like the Blue Angels and the other flying groups. That you know, that's naval aviation. Give us our naval aviation budget, and then you get to watch these neat air shows. That that kind of thing. Well, I don't know if the State Department can fly jets, but it's uh, but they can get out there and and make their case. But yeah, the uh, the actually. Professor Fitzpatrick here from American University has written about the domestic aspects of public diplomacy. And the one president, I guess, who really seemed to have a sense of that was Jimmy Carter. And, uh, but talk to her afterwards and she'll sell you a book or something, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, I, ha I have just a comment to add to Can her question. Can you talk a little louder, please? Is this better That's in the better. microphone? Okay, my name is Catherine Cannonberg. I work for the American Foreign Service Association as an outreach coordinator, and that is exactly what we are trying to do in response to this woman's question. We're trying to build an outreach program to develop a constituency for the Foreign Service, a fan club for the Foreign Service, help educate the American public about what we do overseas, what our embassy platforms do. This is exactly what we're trying to do because we, we feel we get that feedback from many Foreign Service officers that uh, when they come home from assignments, the, their friends, uh, outside of maybe their closest friends and family, have no idea what, what they do. We, they, they have no idea how important the role of the Foreign Service is in protecting national security uh, and in promoting American uh, interests and values all around the world. And we're doing this primarily through our Speakers Bureau. So if, uh, you know, we, we've recruited a lot of retiree Foreign Service members, uh, officers into our Speakers Bureau to talk to their Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs, their, the, the local high schools. Um, we've formed partnerships with the World Affairs Council, um, with the UN Association, with Sister Cities International. We're working on forming these partnerships with organizations that have a similar interest in increasing the participation in the globally engaged and in increasing individuals in, in the global conversation um, and that have local chapters you know all around the country that our uh, retirees primarily can get involved in. We do have some active duty Foreign Service officers who are members of the Speakers Club but they have more limitations in what they can say, they need clearance and so on. So we're accomplishing this primarily through our retirees in our, in our Speakers Bureau. And certainly there are a lot of uh, exchanges uh, that involve uh, international students and others coming to the, the middle of the country. Uh, all the way to the back. Thank you. I'm Gary Arlen from Arlen Communications. This is a question about media technology and some of <coughs> your thoughts of where you go beyond the hashtag policies. 35 years ago, a friend of mine uh, started a network called C-SPAN. I had you first met him. A little bit louder, please. 35 years ago, a friend of mine started a network called C-SPAN. He had I'd met him when he worked in the Nixon White House's Office of Telecommunications Policy, and his point was that disintermediate the liberal media so that uh, politicians in Congress, in this case, could speak directly to the public. The hashtag uh, environment seems to be going that way an awful lot. Certainly, the president-elect's comments in the last few months have directed it that way. I know that the State Department has a lot of social media activities going on, but what do you see as the whole role of this intermediate, this intermediate, this press, which you have also already described as ailing, financially ailing at the very least, and talent ailing as well? So uh, wh where may this happen, or where may it go? Well, that's, I was, I was speaking, using an example of the U.S traditional news media, but I think it, it's an issue in many other places around the world. In some places, even print media are is still extraordinarily healthy. Um, but I think that, the, that even when you have newspapers and, and radio and television news remaining healthy, you're going to have a new level of competition for the attention and loyalties of the audience because they have so many other venues involved. Um, and that's not necessarily good because you can get into this me news thing. You know, when I was growing up, we had NBC and CBS, and then we had a little bit later on ABC became a purveyor of the news. And if you wanted to watch the news, you had those three choices. That was it. And they were basically centrist in their outlook. And if you wanted something else, you could go 
you know, subscribe to a national review or, or something like that and get that viewpoint. But now we have the, the, instead of having the pie cut into three pieces, we have it cut into an infinite number of pieces. And so if you feel, well, I'm liberal, I like MSNBC. So MSNBC tells me what I want to hear. I'm conservative, I like Fox. Fox tells me what I want to hear. That, I think, is, is the big danger. And then you've got websites and Facebook postings and Twitter accounts that you can, that you can follow in, in the same way. And it's obviously, it becomes insidious to, to varying degrees. I mean, I'll give you an example, Islamic State, to show you how, how these things proliferate. Twitter, in one month's time, shut down 125,000 Twitter accounts that were Islamic State linked. That's the number they shut down in a month. Who knows how many more are out there and how many more sprung up immediately afterwards. So you get a sense of the volume that is out there. And, you know, I, just when I talk to my students, they have various things they like to, they like to follow, uh, various things they pay more attention to than others. And very few of them are the New York Times website or CBS or anything like that or even CNN. They, they go wandering all over the place. Now, I would hope that my students, well-trained as they are, uh, would, have, would have a certain amount of sense in what they pick. But if you're just sort of there and you've got a new cell phone and you're looking around on Twitter and you see these vaguely interesting things that are trending, you can get locked into these new accounts. So you could argue philosophically that, that more news is not necessarily better news that having all these venues available, unless you can distinguish amongst them, is, is not necessarily a good thing. You should be able to say, well, the more discussion, the better. The more venues, the better. That's great. That's very democratic, with a small d. I better add that. Um, and, uh, but, but when those venues are delivering fake news or, or very biased news, and you don't have a sense to look elsewhere, that's uh, that becomes problematic. Might uh, add that the more Phil Sieb, the better. But we do <laughs> promise you all to uh, end by one fifteen, one twenty, because many of you are on tight schedules. So please join me in thanking our speaker, Phil Sieb. Thank you. This ends our formal program. We will be back in January with. Uh, I saw Debbie Trent. There she is. Uh, with unconventional public diplomacy coming in January. <laughs> Until then, we're adjourned.